name is Tom Kiley, and uh, for about 14 years now, I've been involved in creating alternative media so that people like you can uh, get educated the way I'm educating myself. I'm fortunate enough to meet great people like our guests tonight, and then I can bring them onto my program. And as I'm learning, it's kind of like an open university. And I'm on the radio in Austin, Texas, and that's on the internet. I'll be happy to speak with anybody about that if you'd like to find out more. So in the course of serving my community, the people that listen to my show, I'm very blessed because they provide me with the, the entree to meet people like our guests tonight, who I'll introduce in just a moment. And so the genesis, the way that our evening together tonight started was by uh, my research for my show, and I came across both of these fantastic speakers. And they've both been on my show several times and uh, to speak about the very important topic that we're going to cover tonight. And when I had Rabbi Shapiro on the show in the break, I'm talking to him, and I said, by the way, there's this guy named Galat Otzman. Have you ever heard of him? He says, heard of him? I've read his book. And I said, whoa, okay. So the next time Gilat came to New York, which was last March, I got the two of them together at a kosher deli, and it was just an amazing, amazing conversation that I was so privileged to just be on the sidelines and able to listen to. It was a PhD course over, uh, you know, like uh, matzo ball soup and uh, some pastrami. And, uh, and, 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 and Galat made the, an exception. He doesn't go to kosher, but for this man he did. So anyway, uh, that's how it came together tonight. This is not a night for the haters, okay? In fact, this night tonight has been inspired by the haters out there, okay? Because we all know that uh, tensions are rising, and uh, it's not easy, okay? Galat Otzman, when he speaks... He's, uh, or when he plays music in, in Great Britain, people have his gigs shut down. They don't want you to hear what he has to say, okay? And Rabbi Shapiro, uh, um, we, we've all heard of David Duke. David Duke doesn't want you to hear what Rabbi Shapiro has to say, okay? So something, uh, we're doing something right. When, when um, what uh, Gilat refers to as Jewish lobbies don't want you to hear what he has to say and what when David Duke doesn't want you to hear what the good rabbi has to say. So this is going to be like uh, atomic energy tonight, okay? It's not for the haters. Um, personally, I, I grew up on Long Island, not very far from here. When I was a kid, I thought that you were either Catholic or Jewish. That's all I knew, okay? And uh, later on, obviously, I found out more. So uh, the world is changing, and mythologies that we've all been raised on are not covering the problems of the world anymore, and they're fraying at the edges. And tonight we're going to go into what's behind some of that. So first, um, from Bayside, Baywater, Queens, Queens, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro, a great scholar, and he's here with us tonight. I've learned a great deal from him, and actually he's <laughs> helped me relieve a great deal of uh, angst that I've been going through because I never thought I'd be in this position where, um, you know, I w I've been accused as being a, a, a Zionist operative. Now I'm getting uh, anti-Semite hurled at me, so, you know, I could sort that through. And then Gilad Otzman, uh, from Israel originally, uh, accomplished jazz musician, philosopher, and quite outspoken um, on the same issues and the two gentlemen approached them from two different angles, and that's what we're going to do tonight. Good evening. I'm uh, very happy um, to be in New York again. This uh, town is my mecca, being a jazz musician. And I'm very delighted uh, to share a platform with you, uh, Rabbi. Um, we, had, we met twice now, and it, it was very, uh, uh, it was an enlightening experience. I learned a lot. Um, I'll try to make it very, very short. I will uh, present my uh, doctrine in a very uh, schematic way, and I believe that uh, you'll be able to elaborate later on the Jewish perspectives uh, involved. Um, at a certain stage, I uh, realized that uh, something is uniquely problematic 
with Israel, uh, the way in which Palestinians are treated, the way in which uh, minorities, uh, um, basically cheap labor, um, mostly immigrants are treated in Israel. It's appalling. Uh, it's uniquely um, devastating, very unusual for a, a country that regards itself as a democratic state. And I obviously started to look into it. It was very interesting for me. And uh, it occurred to me that uh, as a person who was born in Israel, is that in order to understand um, the problem, we have to accept that Israel defines itself as the Jewish state. If it wasn't clear uh, for uh, enough to uh, uh, most people just recently, uh, the, the, the government, the cabinet, approved the Israel, Israel's national bill, uh, which actually uh, um, accepts that every Israeli policy should be actually driven by the Jewishness of the state. Yet, starting to talk about these issues, about Israel being the Jewish state, we have to understand Israel defines itself as the Jewish state, it decorates its airplane, airplanes with uh, Jewish symbols. Starting to talk about the Jewishness um, of the Jewish state, um, um, it was very problematic. I started uh, to come across, uh, um, to be subject to a lot of harassment, and by the way, not from Zionist bodies, but actually from Jewish left bodies, from organizations like uh, JVP, Jewish, Jewish Voice of Peace, which took me by a complete surprise because I was opposing Israel, I was opposing uh, those oppressive measures. And uh, I'm very happy with this opposition because it was, an, it was an opportunity to try to understand what is Jewishness. The first question that I ask myself is who are the people who define themselves as Jews, who identify as Jews, I came with a very, very uh, simple, uh, categorical uh, answer. I think that the people who identify as Jews are divided into three categories, and they are not exclusive categories. Most people are kind of, can, can be um, 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 identified with more than just a category. The first category, and I think that we have quite a few of them in the room today, are those who call themselves Jews because they follow the Torah, because they see Judaism as the core of their identity. Now, this is an innocent category. Why it is an innocent category? Not because the Torah is perfect, and we probably don't, uh, don't, uh, may, may not agree about it, not because it is clean and uh, morally more clean of any um, devastating or racist uh, um, um, concepts, not at all. The fact, the quite an embarrassing fact, is that rabbinical Jews, Jews who follow the Torah, and the Talmud, which is a very uh, problematic text, uh, were all through their history kept aside. They've never been involved in any collective genocidal attempt. Something that we cannot, against other people, something that we cannot really say about secular. Jews, and especially progressive Jews. From the moment of emancipation, we see, and it's very unfortunate, a lot of Jewish bodies at the center of too many disasters. Uh, one could 
talk about uh, the Bolshevist uh, revolution that and we understand now, uh, we are entitled to, to, to see it as such, was largely um, a, a Jewish movement or at least uh, overrepresented with um, um, assimilated uh, Jews. Uh, we can look at uh, the Olodomor, which is a massive, probably the most horrid uh, uh, crime uh, of the 20th century. And again, we see a lot of uh, Jews like Yagoda, uh, the Bolshevik, at the center of it. Um, we can then look at the civil, uh, at, the, at the Spanish Civil War. Again, nobody like to talk about it, but this war flattened Spain. It's quite shocking to find out that quarter of the International Brigade were Jews. I don't argue that they went there to destroy, but it is a very kind of concerning question. Why, how is it possible that, uh, that uh, an interventionist war, we find so many Jews? They actually believe that they, right, they fight for the right cause, and I don't, don't debate it. Um, and then a few years later, we see the Nakba, 1948 in Palestine. And again, it's not rabbinical Jews. These were left so-called progressive Zionists. It is an oxymoron. Uh, you American probably know about uh, the Jewish influence on, uh, within the neoconservative school. We are paying the price for uh, those wars. None of those wars are rabbinical wars. All right, so the first category are Jews, Jews who identify with the Torah, with Judaism. And this is an innocent category. Another category is those who identify as Jews because they have Jewish heritage. Again, a completely innocent category. The fact that you have a Jewish mother doesn't make you into a war criminal. It doesn't work that way. The third category is very, very problematic. The third category is those who identify politically as Jews. Now, when it comes to Zionists, it is very clear. They say, we are Zionists, and this is how we identify. Interestingly enough, the Jewish anti-Zionists also identify politically as Jews. They don't identify with the Torah. It's not in necessarily uh, the fact that they uh, have a Jewish mother. They identify politically as Jews. And you ask them what your Jewishness means. And they don't really have an answer. When you try to dig into it, they come with uh, matzah balls, chicken soup, and you tell them, listen, uh, we, we do appreciate it, but you understand that uh, matzah balls is not a political argument. Guess what? It is not even an ethical argument. It's not an argument. It's a soup. <laughs> and um, when it comes to uh, Jewish anti-Zionists, they have a lot to conceal, because I'm going to share with you a very embarrassing fact here. In the racist Israel, the third party in the Knesset, the third biggest party in the Knesset now, is an Arab party. Quite embarrassing, considering the fact that in all those Jewish organizations, you don't find a single guy in the board. Why? Because they're more racist than Israel. How embarrassing. However, so I, re I realize that there is a kind of a, a unique identity that we try to, ident to, 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 to identify, to understand, and it is an empty identity. The more I try to look into it, the more, the more severe were the measures that were implemented in order to silence me. Now, I'm a jazz musician, so it's not very easy to silence a jazz musician because we are, we are, we are used to play too many notes that nobody likes to listen to. So I decided to go deeper and deeper into this issue and try to identify what is this J-word. J-word, again, again, 
Judaism. Judaism, as we mentioned earlier, is the same concept. Judaism is an innocent category. By the way, if it was an innocent category, and we can talk about it later, it may not be as innocent as time passes by. Because when we look at Orthodox Jews now in Israel, uh, some sects, and they're actually the vast majority, are becoming more and more radical, uh, radicalized and uh, more and more belligerent. And uh, they bought into the Zionist uh, narrative, Rabbi Cook, and so on and so on, which deser it, it deserves uh, attention. So Judaism, at least traditionally, is an innocent category. The Jews, another very problematic J word, the Jews. The Jews is still an innocent category. The fact that you are a Jew doesn't necessarily mean that you have anything to do with Palestine, with Wall Street, and so on. Jewishness, Jewishness is a very, very problematic concept. What is Jewishness? Jewishness is, to a certain extent, and maybe we don't agree, as we see it now, this chicken soup thing, this chicken soup politics, is a modern invasion. How do I define Jewishness? Jewishness is a template, template that facilitates exceptionalism. So when it comes to the Zionists, they say we have, you know, we take the Bible, they, they, they take the Bible, whatever they want from the Bible, whatever they need from the Bible, and they made God into an estate agent. That we, we can go, you know, we, you know, we've been here before, 2,000 years ago, you have to move, you Palestinians. Quite unusual argument when you think about it. Would the Italian get away with uh, uh, coming to London, tell the Brits to move because they've been there 2,000 years ago as Romans? Unlikely. But when it comes to the Jewish leftists, the anti-Zionists, they use exactly the same argument. They say, Oi, we are privileged as Jews. You have to listen to us. Oi. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. You are laughing because you know that I'm telling the truth. We have a special role in the movement. Oi. Yeah? It's very problematic. You see the same template of chosenness that is not ethically grounded, not politically substantiated. It is just a template of exceptionalism, that facilitate exceptionalism. When you look at it in a critical manner, you find out that from their perspectives, Judaism is just one Jewish religion. Everything can become a Jewish religion. At a certain stage, Bolshevism was a very popular Jewish Religion say, oh, it looks it was so wonderful. We believe in equality. We are better because we believe in equality. I hope that you can see how strange it sounds. You know, yeah. Well, look at me. Yeah, and then free market <coughs> became a Jewish religion, and then egotism, Ayn Rand, became a popular, popular Jewish religion, and then. According to a, a hero, I think that we both uh, kind of appreciate Professor Ishayao Leibovich, then the Holocaust became a, became a Jewish religion. I believe, and I, believe, I also believe that this is why we share this platform, that we are dealing with a very, very dangerous identity. I believe that unless we learn to call a spade, a spade, to understand this identity, to understand the ideology, to understand where it aims, what are the origins of this thought, we may 
find ourselves in a much bigger crisis. The situation is volatile. It is not just Israel. It is all over the world. You can talk about ISIS. You can talk about Baltimore. You can talk about the situation in America. You can talk about your own city. Look what happened to, to this city. When I've been in New York I, for the first time 25 years ago, it was a real this where we are. You know, it was a very diverse place. Jazz musicians could live here and play in the, in the end of their street. They cannot live here anymore. It's unreal, the situation here. We have to learn to identify the problems and to learn to talk about them openly. I believe that here in America, your most important ideological, cultural, metaphysical asset is the First Amendment. If you don't celebrate it, you will go down. And this is what I try to do. I would like to let you now, Rabbi Shapiro, take over, and I will get back to it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Gilad. Uh, I haven't been in a movie theater for over 50 years. The last time I was in a movie theater, my mother brought me to hair and see Chitty Chitty Bang Bang in Radio City Music Hall. It was about a half a century ago, and, I, and I'm just enthralled. This is what the inside of a movie theater looks like. It's just like its reputation, you know? And, and I want to thank Gillard and, and Tom and, and the people for bringing me here, because otherwise I never would, have, never would have been here. This is a real cool place, you know? They have like these chairs going up like that diagonally. It's very interesting. And, and I also want to, before I start, I want to thank Matteo, Lauren, and Curtis um, for being the most uh, wonderful hosts, and even though I gave them a hard time, especially Lauren, I apologize for that. Um, and uh, I want to thank them for, for taking care of me. They're really the most wonderful uh, staff that you can imagine. And I also want to thank the Mossad agent that's sitting in the audience over here. Yes, I did notice you. And <laughs> what Gillard said, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to comment on it a little. I'm even going to try to explain my understanding of, of what he means. And basically, th there's a lot of confusion. There's a confusion he, he mentioned as to what a Jew is, what Judaism is, what Jewishness is. And that's really the core of the problem. When I say Jew and when Gillard says Jew and when somebody in the audience here says Jew, we may mean three completely different things. And, and then when you speak about what Jews are and how they act and how they behave, that's where the confusion happens. I mean, uh, the word F-16 means something different to a fighter pilot than it does to a photographer. And if they talk about if F-16 is, 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 is a good tool for the nighttime, if it's good to, uh, one can say yes and one can say no, and they're really talking around each other because they don't know what they're talking about. Um, uh, when Gillard says he did 200 gigs this year, so that's great. If my wife tells me she did 200 gigs, I'm taking away her cell phone. Okay, it means we need a new, new data plan. When Gillard says he, when Gillard says he loves bop, and a 12-year-old girl says she loves bop, he's talking about music, she's talking about a magazine. Now, can you imagine this 12-year-old girl arguing with Gillard about when the post-bop period started? Gillard's talk, Gillard says, well, it's the mid-1960s. And she's saying, what are you, crazy? The magazine was printing monthly until June 2014. And she's saying that he really doesn't know what he's talking about. He's stupid. And she's saying, he's saying that she's just a, a dumb little kid. And you know what? They're both right because they're using two different definitions of post-bop, right? It's the same thing when you say Jew. When I say Jew and when somebody else says Jew, and Jews are racist, the Jews are not racist, and the Talmud even. When, when Gillard talks about the Talmud, when I talk about the Talmud, when someone speaks about the Bible and I speak about the Bible, we mean completely different things. And because of this, that's where all the confusion happens. I'm an ultra-Orthodox Jew, and that's why I haven't been in a movie theater for 50 years. And to me, Judaism, being a Jew means one thing. Judaism is not a culture, chicken soup. I met Gillard the first time in a, a, a kosher deli uh, on Broadway, and he sits down and he says, first thing he says is opens the menu and he says, what's the most Jewish food? So first thing I said, I said, there's no such thing as Jewish food because Judaism is not an ethnicity, but if you want to know which food Jews would probably eat most, order the sushi. <laughs> 
Judaism is, being Jewish is not an ethnicity. Being Jewish is not a culture. Being Jewish is not even a blood family. You can convert to Judaism. You can't convert to a blood family. You can't convert, you cannot convert to a race. Judaism is a religion. That's all it is. In particular, specifically, in the year 2448 after creation, God came to Moses and the Jews on Mount Sinai and gave them the Torah. No, I was wrong. That's not true. God came to a group of random people who were not a nation at all. They were not Jews and gave them the Torah. Because they got the Torah, they also received with it a mission to fulfill God's 613 commandments in this world. The reason they got it was because God was and still is willing to give it to anybody who's willing to accept it. Those people who were there were willing to accept this job. When I give you a job, I'm also presumably giving you the tools to get the job done. God then created the Jewish people. It's not that there was a Jewish nation called the Jewish people who created the religion. No. The religion created the Jewish people. The definition of a Jewish person is somebody who is transformed by receiving the Torah. You could receive the Torah on Mount Sinai like the Jewish nation did then. Or, our tradition tells us, that the souls of many people who are not yet born will also receive the Torah on Mount Sinai. God ensured that those people will be born. When they're born, they will have Jewish mothers. They also receive the Torah on Mount Sinai. Or, if you weren't there, neither in soul or in body, you can accept the Torah now, and you're one of the Jewish people as well. The Torah makes the Jewish people. Had God not given us the Torah, it's not that we would, not, we would be the Jewish people without a Torah. Rather, we would not be the Jewish people. Had God given the Torah to another group of people, had someone else accepted it, they would be the Jewish people. Now, you don't have to accept this story that I said, but that's what religions are about. You don't have to accept my religion. But without the Torah, without Judaism, there are no Jewish people. If a person doesn't believe in this narrative that I just said, he doesn't believe that God gave the Torah to the Jews on Mount Sinai, and you don't believe that people were transformed by the Torah, then you don't believe in the Jewish people. There is no other definition of Jewish people except for that, those that accepted the Torah. Now, you may, people may identify themselves as Jews, as, as Gil had mentioned, but that's a homonym. That's a homonym. When I say Jew and when someone else says Jew, nobody copyrighted the name. Anyone can call themselves a Jew. Fine, no problem. But let's understand. It's like when I say gigs and Gillard says gigs. When I say bop and when Gillard says bop. When a fighter pilot says F-16 and a photographer says F-16. It's two completely different things. Now, I may believe that if someone had a Jewish mother, even if he doesn't accept the religion, their soul was on Mount Sinai. And I could say that they're Jewish and they're obligated to fulfill the Torah. But if that person doesn't believe what I just said, and that's his choice, it's a free world, then he doesn't believe that my definition of Jewish applies to him. This is the definition of Jewishness, that the Jewish people, the only people that identified as Jewish, held for thousands of years until the emancipation, with a couple of quirky exceptions, perhaps like Benedict Spinoza, it's a historical question. But in general, that is the definition of Jewishness that the Jewish people have held for thousands of years. Then came the emancipation. With it came, came a critical mass of secular Jews. There were Jews that weren't religious, that didn't identify with the Torah. They didn't want to identify with the Torah. But they did identify as Jews. Between then, the beginning of the emancipation and today, a lot has evolved. And the different Jewish identities have evolved in different directions, and that's what's causing the confusion today. A little history is in order. History of Zionism in Israel. They call themselves the Jewish state. 
what exactly is a Jewish state? Now, uh, normally, the way states are created, the way people are created, let's say this country, United States of America, we, we were here in the colonies, and we wanted to break off from the British, and those people who were here became the citizens of the United States. But that's clearly not what happened in Israel. In Israel, you're talking about a case, a strange case, a historical anomaly, where the people had to come into a land. The people existed before the land. Now, you have nationalities without lands, let's say the Kurds, for example. But there you're talking about people who, who, who according to the Zionists, existed first, and then they came into some land. And somehow that land became the Jewish state. How did Zionism start? The Zionists created Zionism in order to solve a problem. What was the problem? Common currency says the problem was anti-Semitism. Well, that's not true. The Zionists did believe that Zionism would end anti-Semitism, anti not because, like you will hear people today say, well, the Zionists wanted the Jews to have an army so they can defend us themselves. You will not find such an idea anywhere in early Zionist writings, anywhere. That was political propaganda that developed much, much later. In fact, Max Nordau, Herzl's lieutenant, said that it is not true. He made a protest against those people that think in those days that the purpose of Zionism was a response to anti-Semitism. And I quote, I have them right here. It is not correct to say that Zionism is a gesture of truculence or an act of desperation against anti-Semitism. The effect of anti-Semitism was only to force them to reflect upon their relation to the nations of the world. And that reflection led them to conclusions which would endure in their minds and hearts even if anti-Semitism were to disappear completely. Anti-Semitism taught the Zionists something about themselves. That even without anti-Semitism, if anti-Semitism would disappear off the face of the earth, they would still have created Zionism. Anti-Semitism taught them something that wanted them to become Zionists. It taught them about a problem in the Jewish people. Anti-Semitism was not the problem in and of itself. What was? Well, we spoke before about anti-Semites. Which anti-Semite do you think said the following? The Jewish people are a very nasty people. Its neighbors hate it, and they're right. Its end will be a Bartholomew night. They'll all be massacred. Now, Holocaust deniers are bad, but a Holocaust justifier is worse. The Jewish people is a very nasty people. Its neighbors hate it, and they are right. Its end will be a Bartholomew night. Vladimir Jabotinsky. If the tables were turned, another one says, and others were like the Jews, wouldn't we have good cause to hate them as well? Yosef Chaim Brenner, another one of the original Zionists. How about this one? Those loathsome Jews are vomited out by any healthy collective and state, not because they're Jews, but because of their Jewish repulsiveness. Uri Tzvi Greenberg, another one of the early Zionists. The Zionists were secular Jews who absorbed the attitudes of the anti-Semites and looked at the Jews themselves with the same disgust and loathing that the anti-Semites did. I'm going to give you two quotes said by two different people. Take a guess who said them. They're almost the same. Quote number one. The Jews are describe the religious Jews. Sterile Jewish masses living parasitically off the body of an alien economic body. I know it's a little redundant, but you gotta bear with the guy. Quote number two. Never a nomad, but only and always a parasite in the body of other peoples. Also about the Jews. Who do you think said these things? Well, Quote number two was Adolf Hitler, Mein Kampf, chapter 11. Quote number one was David Ben-Gurion, Mimam Ad Laam, page 269. The Zionists' problem was that they learned from the anti-Semites how disgusting the Jews were. And the reason the Jews were disgusting was because they looked like me and they acted like me. And they blamed me the religious Jews, for anti-Semitism. What did they hate about us? I'll come back to what Gillard said. Gillard mentioned, and he said I disagree, and I will, about 
problematic statements in the Bible and the Talmud, mm. racist statements, militaristic statements, statements about killing races and people like that. I'll tell you something about the Talmud and the, the Bible. Everyone knows that Orthodox Jews don't merely follow the Bible, you also follow the Talmud, but not only the Talmud, it's the entire body of rabbinic literature. Here's how this works. The verses of the Bible and the pages in the Talmud are kind of like ingredients in a recipe. Taking a, a statement out of the, the Bible and saying, well, uh, God told Joshua to kill the inhabitants of Canaan is kind of like saying, look at this recipe, it has vinegar in it, and guessing from the ingredient what the final outcome will be. The verses in the Bible and the pages of the Talmud are ingredients. The oral law is to us a instruction, how to put the ingredients together, how to cook them. And different rabbis are better skilled at it than others. Some come out with the most beautiful culinary uh, masterpieces, and some just can bake a, you know, Betty Crocker cake, Duncan Hines. So there are different levels of rabbis, different levels of creativity, but the oral Torah to us, our Torah is basically a, a, a method of taking the Bible and taking the Talmud and coming out with a final recipe. What's the final recipe? Well, we have those verses that Gil had referred to. We also have a verse where God told King David that he's disqualified from building our temple because he was a warrior. We have verses in the Talmud that say when the Jews are in exile, we are not allowed to wage wars against the nations even when the nations attack us. We're supposed to run, and we did run. And the Zionists hated us for this. They hated us for not being militaristic. They hated us for not being like them. They hated us for, for, for being meek, and they hated us for running, and they hated us for not defending ourselves. We will not throughout our exile, God said to us, that's part of your, your punishment and part of the way we keep you safe. You do not wage war. You do not uh, kill other people. Collectively, you don't. There's one exception. One exception. If anybody dares attack our religion, not us. You attack us, we'll run. You attack our religion. You try to get us to convert. Then, in horror, will we rise up against our enemies. Not as warriors, not as attackers, but with the same emotion that even the most pacifist mother would have when a band of kidnappers come to take away her children. She'll grab a kitchen knife if necessary, and with no regard for her personal safety, she will attack. With that same emotion, with love for our God and our religion, without any regard for our safety, we will rise up like a lioness to protect what is most valuable to us and what we love the most in the world. And if God wants us to die like that mother, it's not our safety that we were worried about. We were trained to do that. The Zionists created Zionism to extinguish Jewishness from the Jew. They wanted a militaristic Jew. They were ashamed of the way the Jews acted. They were shamed in the face of the anti-Semites and in the face of the world. They thought that the reason the anti-Semites hate the Jews is because they act like we do. Jews were not interested in culture or art, they were interested in Torah. There was no such thing as Jewish art, there's no such thing as Jewish sports. You go through the whole Talmud, you won't find any reference to sports, and I'll tell you something about the language Yiddish. In Yiddish, there are no idioms that make reference to military uh, expressions or, or, or uh, physical strength expressions. In English, we say a guy, he hit below the belt, he's behind the eight ball, oh, he hit a home run. In Yiddish, there is, he slaughtered, Yankee slaughtered the Mets. You will not find any such idioms in Yiddish because Yiddish is a reflection of our lifestyle, not our culture, there's no culture. We wanted, we had our values. The Zionists hated our values, and they were ashamed of it. So they created Zionism to destroy our values. How did they want to destroy our values? Here's what they did. In the day that, 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 that the Zionists came, they came about, the early days of Zionism, nationalism was, was sweeping throughout Europe. They took nationalism and said, you know what, everybody's becoming a nation, and it's so great for them, let's become a nation too. 
And if we become a nation, guess what's going to be? We won't look at ourselves as a religion. We'll look at ourselves as a nation. For example, let's say I wanted to tell the Christians that they shouldn't practice Christianity anymore. Well, I could try to convince them not to practice Christianity. And the Zionists wanted the Jews not to practice and believe in Judaism. But that probably won't work. So what I'll do instead is this. I'll tell all the Christians that Christianity is not a religion. It's really a baseball team. Jesus was the, the, the manager, and all the Gospels were all stars. And this crazy idea that, that Christianity is a religion was made up by priests and stuff in exile because they got messed up in the head. But really, Christianity is a baseball team. I'm going to get a, a stadium and I'm going to print, uh, make uniforms, pinstripes that says Christians over it. I'm going to get them bats and balls to play so they can play in the major league of nations. And I'm going to convince them that if you really want to be a good Christian, learn how to play ball. Forget about this religious stuff. Learn how to play ball. That's what the Zionists did, except instead of a baseball team, they went to try to convince the Jews that the Jewish, Jewish people are a nation, like France and like Spain. We'll get a land. That's Israel. That's a our stadium. We'll get baseball bats and balls. We'll create a language. They sat down to create a language because nations need languages. And we will try to convince the Jewish people, forget about this religion stuff, it's nationality. Support Israel. Um, fight in the army. Then you're a good Jew. That way, we will be real men. We will be purified of our Jewiness. That's another cat. There's Jewishness, Judaism, there's Jewiness. Jewiness and yeah. that's what the Zionists hated. And they figured anti-Semitism would end because if you're just like a regular guy, why in the world would they hate you? They wanted to end anti-Semitism by ending Semitism. Then there'd be nothing to oppose. It was the Jewish character that they wanted to destroy, and to a large extent, they succeeded. There are some Jews that, that think that they're great Jews, even though they, they, they have nothing to do with the Jewish religion. It could be great people, but a great Jew, Judaism is a religion. There are other Jews that are religious, but they think it's good for Jews to be strong and to be, to be masculine and to be, to, be, to be powerful. That is the result of Zionism. It's the character that they changed. I'm going to end with one quote from Vladimir Jabotinsky again. The starting point, the starting point of Zionism is to take a Yid and to imagine his diametrical opposite. Because a Yid is ugly, we're going to instill the Hebrew, that's what they used to call themselves, with masculine beauty. Because Yid is weak, we're going to give the Hebrew strength. Because Yid is ashamed, we're going to give the Hebrew pride. That was their goal, to create people that are the opposite of me. The existence of a Jewish state is an attack on my religion. It's existence. What is a Jewish state? Avigdor Lieberman, in the Israel's website, he said, what Italy is to the Italians and France is to the French, Israel is to the Jewish people. No. Judaism is a religion. Italy created the, the Italian people and France created the French. Israel did not create the Jewish people. God did on, on Mount Sinai. The existence of a Jewish state ch changes the definition of a Jew from a religion to a political entity. That is an attack on my religion. And that we can never tolerate. When Gilad says that the Jews do this or the Jews do that. He's talking about one type of bop. Those are the secular Jews. Our Jews, the Jews that, that they stole our identity. Never mind, you know, the Palestinians say you stole our land. They stole our Jewish name. They stole my identity. They are not the real Jews. Uh, the Tommy Lapid, Yair Lapid's father said, if Moses and Maimonides would be here today, they would say, I'm the real Jew and not the Orthodox. Judaism is not a nationalist thing. Judaism is a religion. Gilles, it's your turn. Yeah. Very interesting points were raised here, and uh, I have to address some of them. And uh, we're probably not going to agree, which is great. As you know, it's, we will have um, a bit of a, of a conflict. To start with the confusion, you talk about confusion. There is confusion, but the most interesting element for me in Jewish politics is the way in which we capitalize 
on the confusion. When it comes to, uh, to Jewish politics, we see a kind of an imaginary triangle uh, with uh, religion in one corner, race in one corner, and nationalism. This is confusion. Is it a religion? Is it a race? Is it a nation? Zionist politics is winning so far because it taught us to bounce all the time. When you criticize the nation, the politics of Israel, say, oh, we are religion. This is anti semitic If you criticize the race, it says, no, we are not a race. We are religion. You are, you can never catch. You are running endlessly. Now, why they are so clever in this form of identity politics? Because the gays and the feminists and the black and now the Palestinians, they are doing it now for 20, 30 years. Judaism, Judaism, not Jewishness, Judaism is a concept, an evolving concept of identity politics, the nationhood, and the ethnicity, it's all embedded inside the notion of Judaism for 3,000 years. And this, po this concept has evolved, you know? So I, for instance, as an Israeli Jew, not a religious Jew, you know, I'm more trained to, to, uh, to deal with identity politics than any other identity activist or even a cultural study uh, uh, scholar in this country. It is in my language, in the etymology. What, how did they deal with us, with the rest of us, stopping us, looking into it, into this triangle, magical triangle? This is Jewish power. What is Jewish power? Jewish power is the capacity to stop you asking, what is Jewish power? Very simple. And ladies and gentlemen, this is not maintained by the Zionists. It's maintained by the Jewish left. By people like Noam Chomsky, who was the first to criticize, with a uniquely boring and clumsy argument, against um, uh, John Mersheimer and uh, Stephen Walt, the book on the Israeli lobby. JVP, their project is to stop us from looking into the Jewishness of Israel, to ask this important question. Mondo Wise, it is now probably the most uh, important blog uh, or uh, outlet on Palestine, changed three years ago, two years ago, their comment policy, and they said, we don't, we will ban any attempt to understand Israel within the context of its Jewishness, not Judaism, Jewishness. Interesting. These are not the Zionists. The Zionists doing the opposite. Lieberman said, no, I'm a Jew. I want to celebrate my Jewishness. Now, another very, so this confusion is there, and it is there to sustain political power. It's not something that troubles us. It, if I'm talking now from a Jewish perspective, it's something that it's a form of empowerment. It's very interesting. Zionism and anti was an, was an anti-Semitic movement, no doubt about it. Unlike you, my friend, I think that this is the most beautiful moment in the, anti, in the Zionist revolution. The self-hatred that those early Zionists developed was a very, very unique moment in Jewish history. By the way, I don't think that they hated you. They hated the diaspora Jew. And you are part of that identity. But they equally hated the Jewish bourgeoisie, the Wall Street broker, the, the Borochov, Borochov uh, spoke about the non-productivity of, uh, of the Jews, the capitalistic identity. They said, we are sickening. We want to change. This is a beautiful thing. This is a beautiful thing. They said, we want to be productive. We want to be different. We want to be masculine. There is nothing wrong about me masculine. I, I tried it once. Um, um, 
and uh, this wasn't a joke. Uh, uh, I wasn't good at it, so I went to the gym. There is nothing wrong about self-loath. I, I developed a lot. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a devoted self-hater, <laughs> and, and my entire philosophical concept is based on identify the problems within my own personality, ideology, uh, cultural understanding, and so on and so on. The problem with Zionism is not the self-hatred. It is the fact that it was actually invaded by this messy notion of Jewishness this confusion that led Israel to where it is. And it will be very interesting, and maybe we'll be, have time to talk about it, to see what this new Jewish identity took from Judaism. To make it very short, the way I see it, they transformed Jewish, Judaic, sorry, Judaic chosenness that is actually a moral burden into a form of tribalism and supremacy and Jewish supremacy. And this is actually the, the, why we gathered it together. This is the moment of transformation. They wanted, they, they, they took chosenness and exactly fell into this confusion and said we are born chosen rather than have to present merits for being chosen. Um, identity theft. Identity theft is fun. The 20th century, is full with stories of identity thefts. The Turks, <laughs> the Turks were robbed by the Kamalites. The Russians were robbed by the Bolsheviks. And you were robbed by the Zionists. <laughs> this was kind of, it's kind of, it was kind of a fashion like 100 years ago. However, however, now we start to understand that in those identity theft projects, this very uh, radical school, secularist school, was actually, um, it's very embarrassing, and, uh, um, a, a Jewish secular school. There are more and more evidence in Turkey, I don't know, people don't like to talk about it yet in the West, that in Turkey, the, the young Turks were actually, the Camelites, how we call them, were actually uh, pretty much uh, a converted, uh, converted uh, secular Jews, people who were a uh, Shabtai Tzvi school of thought. We spoke already about Russia being a Bolshevik, uh, the Bolshevism being a kind of a very uh, uh, dominated by, uh, by Jews. And ladies and gentlemen, Zionism was also a Jewish, a Jewish school. So the fact that you were robbed or you know, an identity plunder or whatever you want to call it is not that, not that unique. It's very common, but it's symptomatic to Jewish secular. I come, I have come to the conclusion that the, the problem that we are dealing with is not Judaism, is a lot to do with Jewish secularism, which I find as a very, a, a very dangerous, very, very dangerous concept globally not just for Israel, not just for the Jews, for America, for the West, especially when it comes to politics. Um, now, this is a big problem I, because I cannot understand uh, uh, my handwriting. Uh, but, uh, ah, um, it, it, yeah. The, the, is Judaism the, anti-militaristic? Militaristic, that we spoke about, <laughs> but, you know. Um, this is this is why this is why I need a rabbi. You know, it's like you know, you know, you know. You don't have to go to Freud. You just go, you know. Is and this is a question to you, my friend. I fully appreciate, respect your stand on issues to do uh, with Judaism or is it the way you present your, your, uh, your narrative? 
But when it comes to Zionism, and it is not very surprising for me, we start to see, and I contradict myself now, because in Israel now, nowadays, the most militant and dangerous um, um, political uh, bodies are Judaically driven. Uh, some of them are uh, inspired by uh, Rabbi Cook and Jewish Messianism. So, what is our take about it? Is it Judaism? Are they still uh, Judaic, or uh, we just accept it and say, you know, Jews are uh, we have different school of so thoughts? It's not a monolithic perception. What is your take? The answer is that. Thank you. You are right, Gilad, we're going to disagree, but the thing I disagree with most is this that you said we're going to disagree. We're not disagreeing much over here. Judaism is not militaristic. The reason why you're right also, there, there are militaristic Jews now in Israel, and they, they tie their militarism to their religion. But the reason is because they, their religion is not only Judaism. They... they tied to their Judaism, they mixed into their Judaism a very strong dose of nationalism. It used to be before Rabbi Cook that if you wanted to be Jewish, you were Jewish, you were nationalist, you were nationalist. Now you could be both, like you could be Jewish and being a Met fan also. Rabbi Cook did a very non-Jewish thing. He took nationalist philosophy and he said, that's Judaism. He disguised it in a Kabbalistic thing, but there are, there, there are things in Rabbi Cook's writings that you could point to, this is exactly word for word, almost to the point of plagiarism, from nationalist secular philosophy. He said, this is Judaism. Listen, Christianity is based on Judaism too. At the beginning they said, that's Judaism. So now you come to me and say, well, Judaism is Christian. No, it's a different religion. They took nationalism, and they said that nationalism, they put a yarmulke on it, fed it some chicken soup, and said, National, if the more nationalist you are, the more Jewish you are. Now, do you know what nationalism did to socialism? Not it created totally. a bad mixture. Yeah. Nationalism, does, nationalism does the same to religion, the same to Judaism. It's a very bad combination. And that's what they, they, they call themselves the national religious. It's a yeah. combination of nationalism and religion. It's not just religion. Judaism in its or organic, original, correct form, the historical form that always, before these Zionist innovations, was a religion. Even non-religious Jews, if you have a, a Jewish mother, you're Jewish, but the reason is because your soul was there on Mount Sinai when God gave the Torah. Somebody that doesn't believe in that and substitutes for his Jewish identity, anything else, any of the things that Gilad said, it's a completely different type of Judaism. If you add something to Judaism, like nationalism, like Met fan, you say, that if you're a Met fan, you're a better Jew. What kind of crazy thing is that? One day somebody's going to say it. I say, if you're a nationalist, you're a better Jew. Same idea. That's what they did. That's a, a, a distortion of Judaism because it's a later innovation. Nobody to this day could figure out from a Judaic perspective, a biblical perspective, Talmudic perspective, where Rabbi Cook got his stuff from. We know where he got his stuff from. He got it from secular nationalist philosophers. He just put it in Kabbalistic terms, mystical terms, but it's secular philosophy. Nachman Krachmal had a lot of that too. I'll give you an example of what the Zionists did to Judaism tonight is a holiday, Jewish holiday, minor holiday, Lag Ba'omer it's called. We celebrate because it was the end of an epidemic that killed, a couple thousand years ago, 24,000 rabbinic scholars. I'm, my, my hair is disheveled, my beard is untrimmed because I've been in mourning for the last 33 days, as have all Orthodox Jews. Tonight, tomorrow morning, is the end of the mourning period, the end of the epidemic that took place, and we celebrate. In Israel, they also have a holiday called Lag Boimer today, but they change the narrative, and they know they change, it's not a secret, go like Google, Wikipedia, everybody knows. They created a mythology out of Judaism. To them, Lag Boimer celebrates the victory, and it wasn't really a victory, the imaginary victory of the Bar Kokhba rebellion against Rome. He lost the war, he won a battle, whatever it is. 
they celebrate the biggest m disaster. It was a terrible mistake. We call Bar Kokhba Bar Kaziva, the big fraud. Today in Israel, on Lag Ba'omer, this is what they're celebrating in all the history books. You probably had this when you were a kid, right? Absolutely. They're celebrating Bar Kokhba, and they're even Orthodox Jews today. Look on the website of the Orthodox Union and others because they, don't, uh, they didn't really go into the history. They will tell you, yes, everybody knows Lag Ba'omer celebrates a victory of a battle of Bar Kokhba. There is no historic basis to that, no Judaic basis to that. And if you look on the internet, you'll see they created a myth. They took Judaism and made it into a mythology. Mythology, you can anything. Thor the Thunder God can come to you and tell you to do whatever he wants. Once you eliminate the boundaries of Judaism, the Talmudic due process that we rabbinical Jews are bound to, then you know what? Your religion, your culture, whatever it is, is a no man's land. And God can tell you anything you want him to tell you. And, and, and you can justify anything you want to justify. I, I, Tegillah, the fact that I was robbed, is not nearly as bad as what the robbers did with my credit card. You know what? Maybe. My concern as somebody who's, whose identity was robbed is not what the robbers did with my birth certificate. It's the fact that they stole my birth certificate and because of that, number one, we Jews are blamed for anybody that has complaints against the Zionists. Benjamin Netanyahu just came to America recently and he said he's here representing all the Jews, not just the Israelis, all the Jews in the world. The reason is because in the Zionist thought, the state of Israel, it's, it's what Italy is to the Italian people, Israel is to the Jewish people. No, it is not. I'm a citizen of the United States of America, and religiously, I am a Jew. I have nothing to do with Israel. People always ask me, wherever I speak, invariably, why do you think of the situation with the Palestinians? Why do you think of the oppression? Why do you think of what's going on? I know my answer is, my answer is, why don't you ask me about the people who are oppressed in, in China, in Madagascar? Israel is not my state. It's not that it's a Jewish state, but I protest what they do. No, Israel is to me like China. That's good. Yeah. What this they, is very important. What they do, if it's good, if it's bad, you know what? I'm concerned as a human being for what goes on, but I'm equally concerned about the people in China and the people in Africa. There is no reason for me to be involved or be concerned about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict anymore than there is for me to be concerned about the Chinese-Muslim conflict. I, I, I think that this is, uh, I, I interject because I think that this is, uh, you mentioned it uh, when we met last time in March, and I think that this is a crucial point. When we hear people like, um, you know, like Jewish progressives who are coming with kind of an ethical argument, Americans like yourself, and they tell us, we believe in one state, or we believe in the right of return, which is a concept that I totally support. I ask myself, what gives an American Jew the right to comment as a Jew on the Jewish state? Or even oppose the Jewish state policy? He's doing it because he is a Jew, and by opposing it, he actually affirms that this is the Jewish state. This is the most appropriate ethical concept. I am an American Jew, but I have nothing to do with Israel. I have nothing to do with this politics, unless I claim for a privilege as a Jew. There are Jews in Israel, yes, millions of them, and there are Jews in the UK when England had a war with the Falklands. Does that mean I have to be on England's side? Does it mean that I have to comment on, on if I agree with England or the Falklands? No. Somebody steals my credit card and they use it. And somebody accuses them of committing a crime with it. Then they come to me and say, what's your opinion? Are they guilty or innocent? And I'm like, give me my credit card back. I have nothing to do with this. By asking me the question and by me answering, I am, I am cooperating with the absurdity. Israel calls themselves the Jewish state. There is no such thing as a Jewish state. Judaism is a religion. A state is a political entity. What Italy is to the Italians, France is to the French, and the Torah is to the Jew. That is our homeland. And we take it with us wherever we are. It's our religion. There is no such thing as a Jewish state unless you redefine Jewishness 
as a political nationality or ethnicity. And even then, it's kind of iffy if it, it makes sense to say a Jewish state. But there is no such thing as a Jewish state. It could be a state run by Jews. If somebody elects uh, Arabs uh, to run Israel, it'll be a state run by Arabs. There is no such thing as a Jewish state. Israel is, to me, like China is. What they do with my credit card, of course I'm concerned. I'm concerned about crimes and innocence and guilty and guilt and, and oppression and suffering all over. And if, and if the guy's innocent or guilty, the guy that stole my credit card, of course I'm concerned. But you know what? Just give me my credit card back. I'm no more concerned about what goes on in Israel than I am about the politics anywhere else in the world. And even if somebody says, you know what, in Gilad, it's, there's a second problem with the Israeli identity theft. We have people like Gilad, good people, who now want to throw away... Well, what about, well, you don't agree that... <laughs> throw away, who want to throw away their Jewishness because they were led to believe that Jewishness is some kind of identity some kind of political identity. And you know what? If that was Jewishness, I'd be a self-hating Jew too. The Jew that he hates in him, I hate also. <laughs> but that's not what I call a Jew. It's like bop and bop. You know, the magazine is crazy. Music is okay. So what he hates in his, with his Jewishness, I hate too. But that's not what a Jew is. It's, it, it's a homonym. And that's where the confusion comes in. By the way, by the way, for qu more than a while, and it in, it's in my book, uh, when I start to look into it, I realized that I didn't have a problem with Judaism. So this is this is where this is why we are sharing a platform, I guess. Anyway, I think that uh, it's their time now. Thank you so much. Thank you.